Everyone seems to know that promiscuous, i.e. reckless sexual behavior has been on the uptick in recent decades, and a lot of people link it to culture and society, and there is indeed a link there. We'll get to that later. But not many people talk about the genetic factors that are involved in human behavior. So, for example, when people, as a rule, talk about single motherhood, they talk about it solely from the lens of a sociological phenomenon, which is to say single mothers produce children and offspring, particularly female offspring, who then repeat the cycle, or alternatively produce male offspring, who then become deadbeat dads, and this repeats itself ad nauseum, because it's a social, cultural thing. And again, that is a factor. Another thing people do talk about very occasionally is a particular variant of a gene, and more specifically a gene, DRD4. But when they do talk about it, they often talk about it in very watered-down, overly simplistic terms. They call it the promiscuity gene. And that's especially common in the manosphere in as much as it's brought up. It's always a little bit more complicated than just that. So it's worth talking a little bit about how this works. So you may have heard the word DRD4 before, but often when it's brought up, as I said, it's sometimes called the promiscuity gene. But this isn't entirely how it works, and neither does that cover the entire picture of how genes work in general or the variants of the genes that actually matter at the end of the day. So yes, there is a gene called DRD4, but this isn't the entire picture. Now DRD4, unsurprisingly, has interactions with the dopamine receptor D4. But whenever we talk about genes, what we're really interested in are the so-called allelic variants of said genes rather than the genes in isolation of those variants. And if you're not aware, a little breakdown, an allele is a variant of gene, quite simply, where the DNA sequence differs between two or more variants. And there are three variants that are most common of the DRD4 gene. They are DRD4-2R, DRD4-4R, and DRD4-7R. And and particular interest is taken in DRD4-7R because the 7R sequences result in the expressed dopamine D4 receptor having less affinity for dopamine binding. And it has been repeatedly proposed as a consequence that this is the reason why individuals who have this allelic variant of DRD4 typically are more risk-friendly and they're more interested in novelty-seeking behavior which they do to increase dopamine in order to facilitate more binding to the receptor. And individuals with the variants 2R and 4R don't have this issue as much, so it's been observed. That's a little bit of a breakdown of this variant of the gene in a nutshell. But people, as I said, frequently blow it out of proportion and say it's the promiscuity gene. Sometimes they call it the wanderlust gene. Certain studies have been done that show that it is involved in willingness to engage in greater financial risks. But we always have to bear in mind when we're talking about genes that it is complex. And so when we're talking about genes, we're much more talking about something akin to a single ingredient in a recipe with dozens of ingredients. So yes, there have been studies done that show a definitive link, at least in part, between individuals who are more promiscuous who engage in one night stands, who cheat, people who engage in financially risky behavior, people who are more likely to travel to exotic places, things of this nature. These things have been associated with this variant of DRD4, DRD4, 7R, but it is complex and complicated. So what I'm trying to say here is that this gene means something, but it doesn't mean everything. And here's where the rubber meets the road when we talk about gene expression, because genes have to be expressed somewhere, and that somewhere, invariably, inevitably, is the environment. So in genetic terms, this single allelic variant of the gene is almost certainly not solely responsible for people's promiscuous behavior, even though there are correlations and associations. It bears some responsibility, but it's impossible to calculate to which degree this particular variant of the gene is responsible for risk-taking behavior, promiscuity, et cetera, et cetera. But as I said, where the rubber meets the road is the environment, and the environment has shifted dramatically. If you have social constraints in place, as had been the case for a very long time, 
decades and decades, if not centuries, then genes are inevitably going to express themselves differently. If, for example, particularly in the female population that might have this variant, the 7R variant, if you have a female population who historically didn't have a lot of options, risk-taking behavior, speculating, of course, would have manifested itself differently versus in the current meta where we see you know, free to be you and me, you can do whatever you want, you can have sex with 50 different people, one eye stands. So what happened probably was that social norms change and that opened up the floodgates, not just for the expression of this gene, but a whole host of genes that on average lead to more risk-taking, adventure-seeking, and novelty-seeking behavior. That's another way it's sometimes described, the novelty-seeking gene. None of these terms really do it justice because, again, it is a single variant of a gene that is being cooked in a much greater recipe called your genome, and the environment is a huge, huge factor here too. But I do think, nonetheless, that it's important to talk about these things and genetic contributions, even though we're at the very, very beginning. We're not even in kindergarten, by way of analogy, to the scholastic system when it comes to our understanding of the human genome. We're more like preschoolers transitioning into kindergarten. But it is important to bring this up, because really what we have is this typical, highly dichotomous manner of thinking that a lot of people engage in. I call it also the Manichaean way of thinking, which stems from a kind of religious doctrine related to Gnostic Christianity, Buddhism, Zoroastrianism, but really these elements in diametric opposition, right? That's a Manichaean way of thinking. But this Manichaean way of thinking really dominates how we tend to divide up the world, and it makes sense. It's simple. So on the one hand, you have the traditional interpretation that it's all just social norms. It's a sociological experiment. And people argue that are in part right obviously, because, yes, the social norms have been relaxed, thus opening up the floodgates. But it's not everything. When you see the repeat of a certain type of behavior, again and again and again, intergenerationally, over two, three, four generations, you can almost certainly assume that there's some genetic contribution there. So repeated single mother households of children, particularly daughters, who give birth as teenagers, very young, past life strategy, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. That, too, is a reproductive strategy that is effective from an evolutionary perspective because evolution just cares about getting genes to the next generation. Fitness is the primary absolute here. So if you were a single mother and gave birth at 15 and your daughter becomes pregnant at 15, gives birth at 16, and her daughter becomes pregnant and gives birth at 14, now I'm not saying that's good in terms of economic, social, or moral cost, but I am saying it's good in terms of getting genes across the next generation, the principle of fitness, the all-encompassing principle of fitness. We don't talk about that. We never frame it in those terms because probably it's frowned upon. You don't want to endorse a certain type of behavior, which I would argue socially probably isn't that great, either microscopically or macroscopically. It's only a good behavior for the purpose of getting genes and cross into the next generation. But when we talk about civilization, at the macroscopic scale, there are other factors at play, and there are other stakes that are important as well. So we can't just say, oh, it's good enough that this results in successful fitness. So yeah, that's something that people who look at it from a sociological perspective always tend to miss out on. But it's important to talk about it. And as much as we do have knowledge about particular genes, it's worth talking about that too. We just can't make the all-encompassing statement that X is the gene for Y or whatever. And DRD47R is, again, something that is seemingly correlated with certain types of behavior, but we need a lot more studies done here. In fact, if you look at most of the studies, they're 10, 12 years old. And to be perfectly honest, genomic science was in its infancy at the time. So ideally, we need more studies done now going forward to get a full picture of how this works. And this is where we run into the problem of a kind of genetic determinism. You have X gene, thus it must be so. First off, we're not omniscient. So there's no way to know that. All we have are correlations. And I think a good way of demonstrating this is with the following. My mother is an identical twin, which is to say she has an identical twin who is my aunt. And she has an illness that seemingly my aunt does not have. Now, you would think, being identical twins, I mean, you don't get any closer than that, that they both would have to have this illness. And arguably, my aunt historically, has been in worse shape than my mother. But there were 
mitigating environmental factors, which I won't go into, that probably contributed to my mother developing this disease, but my aunt not developing this disease. And this is what I mean by non-deterministic. There are so many other factors, these stochastic, unpredictable factors in life that can contribute to genetic expression in ways that are oftentimes unpredictable and in ways that you couldn't have guessed. Sometimes you can, but you can't always do that. So I guess what I'm trying to say is it is important to talk about and emphasize genetic factors and behavior because we almost never do that just as we never talk about evolved behavior and evolved psychology as an incredibly important factor in how we act today. How we developed and evolved 100,000 years ago almost certainly has an impact on how we think and act in the current year. We never talk about that. And we should talk about genes. We should also be careful about not over-attributing too much value or too much significance to any one gene. So... As is often the case, it's not always the case, it's not always the case that the middle road is best, that is a fallacy, but we need to take a little bit of column A and column B here and say, look, this gene and its variant, 7R, probably is somehow involved in promiscuous behavior and risky behavior in general, but it's not the whole picture. The fact of the matter is that with the social floodgates having burst open, that probably allowed all kinds of genetic variants to be expressed that were formally suppressed by totally different social and cultural standards. And I think this is something that's very important to bear in mind. We need a holistic understanding of human behavior, not a monolithic one. So neither entirely social or environmental, nor entirely genetic. It's both. And as a species, we need to try to understand how these things interact. As I said, genomic science is still very much in its infancy. It will take a long time, but hopefully it will get there eventually. And as our understanding grows, so too will our understanding of human behavior and how it interacts with different environments. Anyway, as always, thank you for tuning in. Please leave a like, share, comment, subscribe, all that YouTube jazz. Really appreciate any contribution. And if I'm still alive, I'll check you out later. Take care. May the gods watch over you. Bye-bye. If you like this video, please like, share, and subscribe. And if you enjoy my content, please consider making a donation or becoming a patron. Thanks for watching.